Hello. Um, could you hold out your hand? This is $100. Thank you. It's yours. It now belongs to you. Thank you. Now, you can keep it, or you can choose to give it back to us. Oh. <laughs> what would you like to do? You've got five, four, three. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Michael, and this is Jack, and we're members of Boho, an interactive theatre company from Canberra, Australia. Our work interprets concepts from game theory and complex systems where individual parts behave in simple ways, but unexpected stuff happens when they interact. We use the audience to embody these systems within the context of stories. We wanted to know whether we could do the same thing with TED Talks. So instead of doing one 18-minute talk, we're doing 18 one-minute talks, starting about a minute ago. The next idea we want to look at is that complex systems can be very easy to understand. We aren't scientists. This isn't even my real lab coat. We're performers who wanted to combine absurdism, live music, and interactivity, where audience members weren't exposed or humiliated, but actually made up the mechanism by which the story moves forward. Complex Systems lets us do this and gives us a roundabout approach to some contemporary social issues. We think the concepts of presenting are all very simple, but important to understand. Let's start with some terms. Game theory is the study of situations where the success of one person's choices depends on the choices of others. Cooperation and defection are strategies that players can use to maximise payoffs for themselves. Payoffs are the rewards or punishments following the actions of all players. Agents are virtual simulations that mimic the behaviour of real-life players within games. A system is a set of elements that operate in relation to one another. A complex system is a system with elements interacting to create an outcome that is more intricate or elaborate than the sum of its parts. There's a village. And a warlord rides into town with a bunch of soldiers. He lines everyone up at gunpoint, steals all the food and the supplies. And as he's leaving, something hits him in the back of the head. A stone. He turns and he sees these two young men. Now, neither will own up to throwing a stone and neither will turn the other in. So the warlord comes up with a way of deciding who he's going to punish. He's going to ask them both, separately, one last time, who threw the stone? Now, if neither accuses the other, he'll have them both beat badly, but they'll be released. If they both accuse each other, he'll take them both away as slaves, become his soldiers. But if only one accuses the other, then the accuser is released, back to his family, who rely on him to earn an income. And the one who was accused is shot, dead, in the street. Fair, the warlord says. And the men think, sure, at least there's a chance. We'll both take the beating and we'll both go free. But their eyes catch. And it occurs to them, what if? What if he's thinking he might not be able to work so well with broken bones? And they both realise, no matter what he does, I'm better off if I accuse him. And so it goes. And the warlord laughs. And off he rides with his two new soldiers. In a first world country, a virus presents which causes spinal paralysis in a hundred of cases. A vaccine is developed, subsidised, deployed, but this vaccine tends to cause headaches and fatigue. Unpleasant, but still far better than getting the virus itself. So, of course, everyone goes and gets the vaccine, the population becomes immune, and the virus is well on the way to being wiped out at the cost of a little discomfort to everyone. But on the morning of her vaccination, a woman with an awful lot to do that day thinks to herself, if everyone else gets the vaccine, then the virus won't infect anyone to spread to me. So I'll skip the side effects they're all suffering, and I'll piggyback on their immunity. And she calls her doctor and she cancels her appointment. But the initial drive for vaccination has slacked off, the ads have stopped running, the media panic machine has moved on to something more interesting, and this same thought occurs to more people, and combined with a lack of time, mistrust of doctors and misinformation about side effects, immunisation levels decline, the herd immunity is compromised, and there are enough susceptible individuals that the virus is able to gain a foothold. If everyone would like to do something, but if everyone does it, then everyone is worse off. It's a tragedy of the commons littering, polluting, overfishing, overwatering, overgrazing, overpopulating. We need to do something about everyone's behaviour, and if people aren't behaving the way you want them to behave, it's easier to change the rules and rewards of the games they're playing than it is to change their natures. You can make the rewards for cheating lower, or reduce the risk from cooperating. For instance, we're artists, so we obviously hate money. But <laughs> we're finding that you might start to get a bit self-conscious about continually taking it away from us, so we tweak the rules of the money game. The game is the same, but it's played differently. This time we're giving away two envelopes. One has $100 in it, the other has nothing. You can take a look inside, see which is which, no one else will see. He doesn't know which is which, I no longer know which is which, and we won't look until tomorrow. You just give us back one of the two envelopes. In 
in five, four, three, two, one. Thank you. So what's different about this version? How does your behavior change when the rules of the games change? So by changing rules of games, we can change incentives enough to change behavior. So now we know why we want to know about game theory. Game theory feeds into complex systems because it helps to define rules and tendencies that agents will follow. Where physics helps us identify the ways that particles will behave, game theory lets us identify the likely ways that individuals will behave. Complex systems can take these tendencies and predict the outcomes on the scale of populations, meaning we can identify what all these behaviors will look like when put together. While it is difficult to point at an individual and guess what they will do, after a certain point, the aggregate of behaviors will have a general pattern. Complex systems doesn't require components to be rational to work. Sometimes the outcome is the same. It's the tendencies that characterize the system. When you've got enough parts in a system, very slight tendencies towards certain behaviors can start to make ripples. Chain reactions begin and patterns emerge. There may be a behavior that normally a person would never exhibit, but if someone else nearby starts doing it, there's a chance they'll copy it. And the more people there are doing it, the likelier it is to spread. So this slight tendency, which only comes out under certain circumstances, given a big enough crowd, actually becomes fairly easy to predict. But we want to know more about the way these big pictures are likely to behave. Lucky for us, we can simulate the conditions, agents, behaviours, all these things that make up the systems, and let them interact under a conditions a bit like those found in the real system. So if we take some uh, volunteers, could I ask um, you two here? and then um, one, two, and three there, and perhaps you two here, just to stand up. Don't worry, that's actually the last thing we're gonna get you to do. So you three there, if you could stand up, fantastic. Now, everybody else in the audience, we wanna give a very simple rule. Every time I clap, if you're seated next to, or in front of, behind, anywhere around, anyone who is standing up, we'd like you to stand up too. And if you're already on your feet, then we'd like you to stay that way, okay? Let's try it. So, we can see the little areas of people on their feet are expanding. And expanding again. And beginning to form a bit of an interaction with each other. And then suddenly, what we have is a model that could represent the spread of spot fires into a fire front, or just as easily show the spread of disease from disparate areas to the main population. Thanks for your help, you can sit down. Modelling allows us to apply something approaching the scientific method to predicting the behaviour of complex systems so we can plan. And this can be applied to almost any field of scientific endeavour because complex systems are pretty much everywhere. Termites. A termite mound is made up of tiny blind creatures, foraging, digging, building and signalling. The emergent result is a structure engineered for protection, stability, temperature control and air quality regulation. The brain is made up of neurons interacting through electrical and chemical signals. The emergent result is memory, thought, and muscle commands. <laughs> language is made up of words and phrases that represent ideas. The emergent result is a shifting landscape of abstract meaning applied to different words as users influence each other's lexicons. <laughs> Once upon a time, in a faraway forest, there was a family of clever foxes and a family of cute bunny rabbits. One very sunny summer, the long green grass grew and grew and made food for the family of bunnies. And they were happy because with more grass to eat, they too could grow and grow. And soon the big family of bunnies was even bigger. And the fox family were happy too because now there were more cute bunnies to eat for food. And the clever fox family grew and grew. But soon there weren't very many bunnies left because they were all dead from being eaten. And the foxes didn't have enough food, so they began to starve to death one by one. This was great news for the bunnies though, and without foxes to eat them, they were able to make many, many more little bunnies. And so the foxes came back too. And so things went, lots of bunnies, lots of foxes, fewer bunnies, fewer foxes. But the next winter was by far the coldest the faraway forest had ever seen. And the long green grass was buried under the ice, 
and he couldn't feed the bunnies and they had nowhere to hide. And the clever foxes found and ate all the cute bunnies up and there weren't enough bunnies to make more bunnies and then the bunnies were gone. And then there was no one left for the foxes to eat and they were all gone too. External factors can push a stable system into a self-reinforcing feedback loop. A microphone transmits information to a loudspeaker, which amplifies the information and reproduces it louder. The microphone transmits this information to a loudspeaker, which amplifies the information and reproduces it louder. The a neutron strikes the uranium-235 atom and is absorbed. The atom fissions, releasing energy. It also releases additional neutrons. These neutrons strike uranium-235 atom. An electrical substation is overloaded and it fails. It ceases transmission and its load is redistributed to nearby stations. These substations are overloaded and they... Polar ice caps melt. Light that would have otherwise reflected into space is absorbed into the Earth's system. Temperature increases. Polar ice caps melt. Light that would have otherwise... Without counteraction to negatively dampen the feedback, the result is things getting worse until they can't move. Stable systems can be resilient to change. Generally, only up to a point. Beyond this point, runaway positive feedback can lead to the complete breakdown of the system. Very minor shifts in the behaviour of a society can be enough to push it past the point that it cannot come back from. On Easter Island, 750 years ago, deforestation in the production of Moai sculptures tips beyond sustainable levels. Fishing boats couldn't be constructed, so the usual diet of porpoise meat was unavailable. Land birds were overhunted to compensate, but with nesting sites and trees already wiped out, bird life vanished. No mechanism was left for the dispersal of seeds, which had already been wiped out by the introduced rats. The ecology collapsed completely. Cannibalism became a major source of protein. Disease spread throughout the population, and war broke out over control of the few remaining resources. Any one of these problems on their own would have been difficult. But the problems don't exist in isolation. They're mobile, they interact, they create more problems. And without being very careful, intervention only serves to destabilise the system further. So say we have one problem, rising sea levels. Over time, millions of people living in dwellings along the coast are being hit by increasingly regular storm surges. Poorer communities are abandoned. People flee inland or across borders. Wealthy nations spend money building levees and draining ways where they'll help and subsidising the cost of moving whole communities out of harm's way. But all these new people will need space to live. And whole farms and forests and nature reserves are cleared away to make room for refugees. Without the plants and trees holding it down, the soil is turning to dust. There are dust storms. There are bushfires triggered by all the plants and forests that have been cleared away. Waterways are drained and river mouths close. And because the soil and water supply is failing, the farms are failing. The food supply dwindles. Meanwhile, in a coastal hospital, a patient presents with a cut on her leg, which had occurred three days earlier. During the injury, a single cell of multi-drug-resistant Staphylococcus aureus had entered the wound. Staph divides rapidly, and by this point, there are a billion cells making up the infection. Overcrowding means lots of compromised immune systems, and the strain spreads throughout the hospital. Then the hospital system, as patients are transferred, and uh, specialists are spread thin. The spread is too rapid to import or manufacture more powerful drugs, so hospitals have to decide between treating some patients well or all patients poorly. The disease follows transportation networks. Already highly immune to the most powerful available treatments, the epidemic becomes a global crisis as once again, minor injuries and surgeries carry with them huge risk of life-threatening complications. Meanwhile, the price of food has doubled. Economies are struggling with increased spending on disaster relief. With consumer confidence and disposable income reaching historic lows, and businesses failing in huge numbers, retail sectors collapse. With key areas affected by deforestation, mudslides, poor snowfalls, coral bleaching, floodwaters, tourism sectors collapse. With panic setting in amongst investors looking to keep their money safe before things get worse, stock markets collapse. With unemployment pushing beyond 20, 30, 40 percent in some countries, and industries crumbling under the weight of increased costs produce yields, deteriorating markets. Countries cannot pay their national debts. And with national debts being offset by printing more money, currencies are devalued and any personal wealth still held is eradicated. The influx of refugees rapidly changes demographics in large cities. Camps are set up on the outskirts with trailers for domestic citizens and tents for migrants. 
Immigrant populations are marginalised and there's widespread segregation along religious and racial lines. There's no way of providing public transport. The costs are going up, services are cut, less people use it, pushing up prices again. Buses, trains and taxis all go into permanent strike. The price of oil means that petrol stations are going dry. People are abandoning their vehicles wherever they break down. There's whole streets clogged with rusting metal hulks. People can't get from district to district and slowly but surely suburbs transform into ghettos. There's no system for the transportation of basic goods. The only place to get them is on the black market. Convoys of food and clothes and medical supplies need armed escorts to protect them. Nervous police and soldiers with rifles are strolling through town trying to deal with problems that they haven't been trained for. And demonstrations turn to protests, turn to riots. Looters smash every window within reach trying to find things that they can sell or swap for food. The police aren't willing to go into the camps for fear of the armed militia. The rich are healing themselves off in gated communities with private security forces while armies of hungry people surround their compounds. There's no clean drinking water. People are getting sick in huge numbers. Trade breaks down. Nobody has enough. Tension builds. Reaches flashpoint and conflict like breaks out worldwide. From regionalised genocide to all out nuclear war and all you have left is just enough power to keep track of the death counts as the fire fronts, cyclones, floods and bombs flatten the last vestiges of civilization. We need to do something about all the problems. To do that, we need to understand more about the way systems work. So we use complex systems to model collapse before it happens and come up with strategies to protect ourselves by focusing on policies that change the rules of games rather than appealing to the better nature of participants, which isn't going to work. We need to consider how decisions we make affect the stability of systems that are keeping us alive. And we need to fight against misinformation propagated by groups who are trying to keep the rules of the games from changing. Science is vulnerable to this kind of distortion because it has an obligation to be impartial. We think that artists have a responsibility to fight battles where lines are allowed to be blurred. We're supposed to manipulate emotions. We can fight dirty. So we should. Thanks for listening. I think we just got our first TEDx Canberra standing ovation. Very good. <laughs>